Well, we come to it at last. The big one. The captain of the Enterprise D, E, Chancellor of the Academy, and Admiral to boot, Jean-Luc Picard. This was a lot of fun to write. So make sure you go and check out the article on whatculture.com. I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 things you didn't know about Jean-Luc Picard. Number 10. Tales from the Academy. As a young man, Jean-Luc Picard was brash and arrogant, and often found himself at odds with the rules. That said, he still managed to graduate first in his class at the Academy, despite not getting in on the first try in 2322. His Academy years were marked with successes and failures, with one such mistake almost costing him graduation. In fact, as Picard later stated, were it not for Boothby, he wouldn't have made it out at all. Boothby, for his part, maintained that all Picard needed to do was listen to his gut and stop carving initials in his trees. The younger man was a skilled athlete, winning marathon and taking down Ligonians. He was also a pilot blessed with skills that saw him enter the Speed of Light Club. For this, he piloted the USS Leon de Grance at 300,000 kilometers per second at level flight. It was also during his academy time that he had his fateful run-in with the Nausicans, one that would leave him with an artificial heart, but a very real thirst to prove himself in Starfleet. Number nine, what's in a namesake? Robert Justman wrote in the Star Trek Encyclopedia that Jean-Luc Picard was named for the Swiss oceanographer and engineer Jacques Picard. This Picard came from a family of adventurers and made his mark on history beneath the waves. Picard, along with Lieutenant Don Walsh of the US Navy, were the first humans in history to descend to the bottom of the ocean in the Challenger Deep. There, using a craft designed by Picard and his father Auguste, which was named the Trieste, incidentally the Trieste was the name of the ship that discovered data on Omicron Theta, they managed to reach the seabed in the Mariana Trench. They remained there for 20 minutes, but the ship was ill-equipped for scientific exploration, so it began its ascent without incident. Nine years later, Picard designed a new type of sub that he named the Ben Franklin. It was dropped into the Gulf Stream, crewed by six men, and floated all the way to Maine, drifting with the currents. This international team studied the effects of isolation on the crew, something that would become crucial to preparing astronauts for space missions. Picard was awarded the Howard N. Potts Medal in 1972. He was a founding member of the World Cultural Council. He was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Catholic University of Louvain in 2008. Number eight. 2001 A Space Odyssey and a Connection for the Ages There is little doubt that Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey is one of the most influential sci-fi films ever made. There is a connection beyond the production between the film and Star Trek as a franchise, with Jean-Luc Picard making up 50% of that. For the first 50%, Gary Lockwood stars in both the film and Where No Man Has Gone Before, the second Star Trek pilot several years earlier. His co-star in 2001, Keir Delea, would seemingly try to follow in his footsteps. Memos from 19 1987 list Delea as being in contention for the role of Picard, while other names like Louis Gossett Jr., Yafit Koto, and Stephen Macht were also touted. As the casting process went on, Delea was then engaged to make a VHS audition for the purposes of it being sent to Paramount. This, however, would come to nothing as the studio did not agree to sign a test option agreement with Delea in advance of the audition. For a bright moment, it looked as though the two stars of 2001 A Space Odyssey would occupy coveted roles in Star Trek, but alas, it was not to be, and some unknown shape. Shakespearean actor got the role instead. Number seven, let's talk about Yvette. Yvette Gessard Picard, mother to Jean-Luc and Robert, changed forms through Star Trek. The audience first met her in Where No One Has Gone Before. There, she was an elderly French woman, inviting her son to tea. However, by the close of Picard's second season, we learned slightly more to add context here. First, both Picard's mother and nephew took their names from a star in George Powell's The Time Machine, a 1960 adaptation of H.G. Wells' classic Yvette Mimo and her father René, respectively. Mimo would go on to describe herself as she believed directors and casting agents saw her. I suppose I have a soulful quality. I was often cast as a wounded person, the sensitive role. Her to wear originated the role of Yvette in The Next Generation, while Madeline Wise took on the part for Picard. This version of the character was revealed to suffer from a severe mental illness, one for which she refused to seek treatment. Though this storyline was not handled with, in our opinion, sufficient delicacy, it does add a deeper layer to her relationship with Jean-Luc, who forever blamed himself for her death, having freed her from the confines imposed by Maurice Picard. Ultimately, Yvette Picard was seen as the progressive parent of the two, though this left her at odds with her husband Maurice. It would take many years for Jean-Luc to resolve this generational trauma, though arguably, despite some questionable storytelling choices, it made for a compelling narrative. Number six, 
Is that a ripoff? When Patrick Stewart saw Red, abhorrent as it may sound, it is actually perfectly acceptable to enjoy parodies of Star Trek. Patrick Stewart needed to take a moment to remember this in late 1993 or early 1994. Red Dwarf first aired in 1988, though Stewart was unaware of it while in America, filming Star Trek The Next Generation. When he returned to the UK, he was flipping through the channels and stumbled upon an episode. He recalled that in those first moments he was incensed as he believed Red Dwarf to be ripping off The Next Generation. He said that his hand was already on the phone receiver while the show was still playing and he stopped in his tracks as one of the scenes had him laughing. He then watched a bit longer and found that he was actually truly enjoying the show. Red Dwarf is a comedy that uses sci-fi tropes as complementary to its character settings, though, despite many mutations, there are no aliens. After sitting through the episode, Stewart had become a fan, seeing the series for what it was, a fun comedic take on space travel with some elements he'd wished they'd been allowed to do on Star Trek to boot. Number five, don't be afraid to correct the captain, just make sure you bring the receipts. David Livingston directed Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard in two episodes of The Next Generation, The Mind's Eye and Power Play. Generally, he found Stewart to be very easy to direct, as the actor had a clear idea of who the captain was and how to present that. He did recall one day of shooting, though he was present as producer at the time, not as director. He was standing off to the side and he heard Stewart flub a line. Then to his surprise, the director yelled, cut print. Livingston then approached both and told him what he had heard. Stewart disagreed that he'd made a mistake, as did the director. Livingston then asked the sound team to play the line back back, proving him right. Stewart thanked him and they reshot the line. Livingston later joked that telling the captain of the Enterprise that he'd made a mistake was one of the most nerve-wracking things he ever had done, but as his responsibility as a producer overrode all else, he had to speak up. Thankfully, the recording team were on the ball. Number four, Picard's connection with the original series crew. Out of all the characters from subsequent entries in the franchise, Jean-Luc Picard has perhaps the most ties to the original series crew of the Enterprise. First and most obvious is the connection he shares with Ambassador Spock via his mind meld with Sarah. This linked both men forever and allowed the ambassador to understand his father better after his passing. Picard would share a drink on the holographic recreation of the OG Enterprise with Scotty, lamenting lost loves in the form of their ships. Barely two years later, he would, of course, meet none other than James T. Kirk himself, first in the Nexus, and then sharing the captain's final moments with him. All of this has been confirmed on screen. There is another connection that was confirmed by set decoration, which is the fact he served under Captain Neota Uhura aboard the USS Leon de Grance. The plaque for this ship was seen in the Stargazer. The idea for this was proposed for Star Trek Short Treks, though unfortunately it has not at time of recording come to fruition yet. The name of the ship, incidentally, comes from the character of King Leon de Grantz, as whom Patrick Stewart appeared in John Borman's Excalibur in 1981. There is another link, though this one is a little more tenuous. He and Pavel Chekhov both served on two Enterprises and a ship named Reliant. Number three, Picard played a pivotal role in trying to stop the Romulan supernova multiple times. Star Trek Picard is established on screen that the captain, and later admiral, was instrumental in attempting to save the Romulans from the impending supernova. In this reality, the Jat Vash organised for the Synths on Mars to revolt, killing thousands of people and destroying the rescue armada. In the wake of these events, Picard steps away from Starfleet. The supernova itself originated in Star Trek 2009, acting as the catalyst for the entire Kelvin universe. The four-part miniseries Star Trek Countdown depicts the events that result in Spock's time travel, with Picard playing a pivotal role. In this reality, Picard was the ambassador to Vulcan, with a revived Data in B4's body serving as captain of the Enterprise E. Picard then, with Ambassador Spock, petitions the Vulcan High Council to deliver red matter to the Romulans, which would protect them against the Nova. Despite much debate, the High Council denies the request. This directly leads to Nero's descent into madness, almost results in Worf's death, and leaves the Enterprise E crippled after a fight with the Narada. The comic closes with Picard discovering the fading singularity, the one responsible for sending both the Narada and Spock back in time, with Picard Picard sadly realising they've lost Spock forever. Number two, again with the names. So it turns out that we've been getting Patrick Stewart's name wrong this entire time. Boy, is there egg on our faces? It's fairly well known that Stewart only took on the role of Picard to make a bit of money before returning to the stage, which was his first passion. Having spoken with his agent and friends, all of whom agreed with him that the show would fail quickly, he signed the standard six-year contract. Well, things didn't quite go to plan there. What is less widely known is that for the first 18 months of his time in Hollywood, Patrick Stewart was attempting to negotiate the right to use his own name. Another Patrick Stewart had already registered their name with the Screen Actors Guild, which meant that, professionally at least, Stewart was unable to use his given name. He chose to give himself a middle name, something he felt wouldn't affect his name overall. For just over a year and a half, he was Patrick 
Hughes Stewart until he finally was able to revert back to his original two-worded name. Number one, Patrick Stewart sparked an internet debate on the inclusion of profanity in Star Trek. Jean-Luc Picard, for nearly three decades, didn't swear. Sure, there was the occasional merde that popped out, but that was relatively safe for English-speaking audiences. Then, along comes Star Trek Picard and profanity begins to appear. In the second season, Picard aggressively tells Q that he's had enough bullshit from him, but it's in the third season that things really took off. While filming a scene for the episode No Win Scenario, Patrick Stewart improvised the line, 10 gruelling f***ing hours, which showrunner Terry Metalis decided to leave in the scene, as it captured a real moment between Picard and Jack Crusher. The internet proceeded to lose its collective mind, with debates storming as to whether or not Picard, of all characters, should have been the one to swear. Christopher Monfett, a co-executive producer, argued that the decision was not made lightly, and that the speech patterns of the characters were reflective of the darker tone of the series when compared to the next generation. Ultimately, whether one is for or against the inclusion, Stewart's line sparked continued conversation by fans and non-fans alike which in turn has only fueled the ongoing calls for Star Trek Legacy. That's everything for this list. Did you find it interesting? Did you find it dull and boring? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much to Mel for editing this video. Don't forget you can follow us over on social media. You can get us at Trek Culture over on Twitter and you can get us at Trek Culture YT on Instagram as well. I am at Sean Ferrick on all the various socials. You are awesome and wonderful. Make sure that you live long and prosper until I'm talking to you again. Be kind to yourself and others. Slava Ukraina. Have a good one. Thanks very much, folks.